Thanks. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Peter for organizing this event. It's been a, it's been great. It's been great, and always good to hear uh, CTOs talk about their experiences. So a bit about myself. Uh, I work at Venture Pact, and uh, we basically uh, we're a remote team ourselves, and we help other companies find, build, and manage remote software teams. So. Um, you guys all know what remote work is. It's basically you're working with someone who's not, is basically sitting across the table from you, right? So they're in either a different floor, a different office, a different city, um, maybe even a different country. Uh, but why, why should you even consider working remotely? Um, so there are three main reasons that companies work remotely. The first is um, if you don't work remotely, you, you limit the talent pool available to you to a 50 mile radius from your office. And usually your office is located in a very competitive market, New York, Boston, San Francisco. So if you limit yourself to only a 50 mile radius, uh, that means the talent pool available is less. And usually software itself is very competitive. So that's one main reason companies uh, think about hiring remote talent. The second reason is autonomy. The new, the new age talent wants more autonomy. They want more flexibility. So if you can give them an environment where work is more flexible, then you can attract the best talent because they know that they don't have to go through you know, 10 approvals if their son has a soccer game they need to go to. It's much more flexible, they can work around the schedule, and it creates for a much more comfortable environment for talent. And this is only uh, the, the need and the desire for more flexible work environments is only growing over time. And the third reason companies think of remote work is Remote work forces you to build really great communication processes and knowledge management very early on. So if you know that you just hired a new person and that person is not gonna be sitting across the table from you and can just ask any question, look over their shoulder and ask a question to you, you're gonna make sure that you document everything very well. So what it creates, it creates really good knowledge management systems. So what we've done is uh, you try to tag everything uh, that, you, that you've learned and you kind of create kind of like an internal blog. And when someone has a question, it's not, sent, it's not spoken out loud, it's typed up with tags and it becomes a central repository like an internal Quora and that allows for great knowledge management. Now we only did this because we are a remote company and we realized that this is gonna be more efficient for us to help train people. And secondly, it creates for, uh, it, and it's, it's something you start a lot earlier on if you're a remote company than if you're not a remote company. So there's a lot of advantages to it. Um, but the, there are two key parts. If you're, trying, if you're thinking of doing remote work, there are two main things that you have to do very well for it to work. The first part is screening great people and, and getting them and hiring them. And the second part is managing the people. So screening great talent, this is like, the number one most important thing, we all know that talent is so super fundamental to the success of any development team. I don't care what processes you have in place, if you have the wrong people, it's not gonna work. And so what we found was that in screening great talent, for remote talent specifically, there are three things you gotta look for. Two, two pieces of them you already looked for, right? Technical foundation, cultural fit, and the third piece is remote skills, remote working, which is basically communication. So those are the three sk skills you want to screen for when hiring. Now, what we found was that a lot of the times the companies we work with uh, did hiring in a non-optimal way. So they did hiring basically the way they used to be hired and the way they used to be interviewed, which was they try to ask these like really complex brain teasers or they'd say like how many ping pong balls in a in a, how many ping pong balls can you fit in a plane? Or get this like algorithm problem and, and something like that. And these complex algorithm problems. In reality, is that exactly what they're gonna be doing in the job? Usually it's not. So you, what we've done is we said, okay, you try, we give them an assignment where we, uh, it's like a coding assignment, similar to what we think they would be doing on the job. And usually it's over 30 minutes and under two hours, this coding assignment. And you ask them to screen share with you while they're completing the coding assignment. And you tell them like these are the few test cases that need to get back. They need to you need to pass. And while they screen share, you ask them to think out loud. And what we found was that gives us amazing, amazing information about the person that you're working with. You see how they code. You see how they think. You see how they search because you're screen sharing with them. 
And you're not just looking for them to figure out a way to pass those tests. You're looking to, for them to think about a way to make sure that they're creating codes for the future. Are they thinking about the long term? Are they thinking about the next person who's gonna come on? And these things matter a lot with remote people because you get, again, you don't have someone sitting next to you and just be like, oh, I don't understand your code and you just explain it to them. You want them to actually understand your code. You're creating a process by which it's easy for the next person to understand. So we looked for people who actually think that through as opposed to people who are trying to figure out a way just to get the tests to pass. And that's the first piece. The second thing is the cultural fit. And this part is very important. And usually what we found was that most companies would go in and they'd have like four, three, maybe and depending on the company, but like they'll have a few people interview the person. And everyone will go in and be like, tell me about yourself. Ask kind of generic questions. And that would take up a large part of the interview. And everyone would ask that same question. And then there would be uh, kind of like generic kind of interviews. And then it was basically like, I kind of like the guy. And that's what, that's, and then like three people said, I kind of liked him. And then you kind of make a decision. And this happens as relatively consistently. Whereas in reality, you should be thinking, what are the key values of the company? What is the culture of the company? And people should be interviewing, testing for those specific values. So person one goes in, like for us, like key values, right? We want someone who's optimistic. We want someone who's down to earth. We want someone who has a sense of urgency. We want someone who's committed. So with people, you ask specific questions intelligently to get a sense of what that pers the, the person's skills. And the first person is interviewing for different values than the second person. So you have much more focused interviews as opposed to tell me about yourself, uh, be, take everyone as spending 10 minutes on tell me about yourself, takes up one third of the interview times four people, and that doesn't really give you data that's relevant to those three key points that I mentioned. So those are the first two. The third point is remote work and their communication skills. So you can ask questions in the interview about this, but really the best way to figure this out is after you like the person from a technical standpoint and a cultural fit standpoint, um, you don't just hire them, right? You kind of date before you marry. So what we do is we'll just tell them, okay, for the next two weeks, we're gonna give you, a, we're, pay, we're gonna pay you for the next two weeks, but it's gonna be kind of like a paid trial where you do a small project for us and you're gonna work remotely. And during that two weeks, what you're gonna see is you're gonna see a lot more of their technical skills. You're gonna see a lot more of their cultural fit. But more importantly, you're gonna see, can they work remotely? And remote work is not for everyone. And the people need to be trained to do it well, but you can tell if that person's a natural remote worker. You can tell that because based on the way they ask questions. Are they proactive in their communication or are they waiting for you to tell them to do something based on a small project? Do they get, if they get stuck in a problem, are they comfortable communicating and using all the tools of the company? Do they fit in with the culture? All those questions are gonna be very clear after the two weeks. So the probability after the first coding assignment, after the cultural uh, interviews, and after an additional two weeks where you get a lot of remote work testing and uh, more additional technical screening and additional, because you actually see the work they're doing and, and, the, and you can also see how they communicate, they fit the culture. The probability of that hire failing, if you decide to hire them, that's very low, right? And so it is a little more rigorous. And some people are not happy with the way we hire because they're like, you guys are going through a long process before we get to that final stage. But at the end of the day, they're also able to test us. Do we like working with this company? You know, during the two weeks, they're seeing how responsive are we. Um, so it's kind of like a mutual thing. We're both trying to see if it's a good fit. And the second thing is that it's much easier not to hire someone than to hire someone and then fire them, right? I think we can all agree on that. And the second point is, if you hire the wrong person, the time it takes you to find out it's the wrong person uh, depends on one, the size of the company, because the bigger the company, it's harder to kind of track the problem. And second, it, uh, it costs a lot of money because you're going to hire them and you have to go first go through a training process with them so that you won't figure out if that person's good. And then the additional time to figure out if that person's bad. So you're wasting a lot of money. So you definitely want to have, it's better to go longer, spend more time on the interview, have a higher bar, uh, but you know, we're open to remote talent. So we have a huge pool of talent available to us. So we can be very selective because you have a large talent pool available. So now you found the right person. The next piece is management. So when it comes to communication, uh, communication is the core piece, the core part of management. And there are kind of the two main pieces that we recommend 
uh, under communication is when you're working remotely, it's, it's good to have two hour overlap between one person who's remote and another person in the company who's also remote, where they're both available online via chat. And that two hour overlap allows for prompt responses to questions. I'm available and it also creates a more good culture where you can even just chat about specific things happening. So you wanna to try to have that two hour overlap and it does require some coordination if you're truly global and remote. If you're local and remote, where you're in the same city or in, in the US, um, you'll definitely have at least a two hour overlap between a San Francisco developer and a Boston, New York, you know, uh, Midwest, East, East, uh, East Coast developer. So that's less of an issue. The second part is the call. Now, we highly recommend doing video calls because it creates a more personal relationship with the developer. And secondly, um, you want to do a call but you've got probably daily around 5 to 15 minutes. Usually you're talking about what they did yesterday, what they're doing today, and challenges they face. Those are kind of the three things you talk about, uh, pretty standard. Uh, and some people have different preferences around how to do that. Some people like to put those, uh, put some things on the task management, put some of that piece in the task management to only talk about challenges on call. You can kind of optimize that for your company. Uh, but doing video calls and having overlap where people are online and creating that culture where everyone's online when they're working is really important with remote work. The second thing under communication is task management. So three key pieces to task management. First is who is accountable? Who is responsible for this assignment? You know, many times we'll see someone even in in-person meetings and over in Skype meetings, they'll have like three people, the whole team will be on and the leader will be talking about some idea and then they're like, yeah, this would be really cool if we get this done. And then no one is like specifically assigned that assignment, it doesn't get done because it's kind of like on the back of someone's head and they're like thinking about it, but it doesn't get done because no one is accountable for it. One person needs to be accountable for it to drive the thing forward. So you task management, the first piece is getting, having someone accountable. Second piece is what am I supposed to do, right? It's the assignment. And so the more clarity around that, that means you're, you're communicating well. And the third piece is the deadline. When is it due? Um, and that is really important for management of expectations. When is my, when is, when are you thinking this should be done by, right? And you can go really high level on the assignment or really low level, uh, depending on who you're speaking with in the specific environment. But having deadlines creates this concept of, oh, okay, I know when we're thinking this should get done by. And, uh, and it helps manage expectations. And this is amazing for feedback. We love task management and you can look at Jira or Asana or Trello and everyone knows this, but it's really, really good for feedback because you can be in a feedback session, you'll just pull up that whatever task management tool you use and you'll be like, this is what you were supposed to, this is what you were held accountable to, this is what you're supposed to do, this is what it was, and this is when it was due. And then you ask two questions. Was it done on time? And was it done well, right? And if it wasn't done on time, why wasn't it done on time? It might not be because they did a bad job. It might be because you did a bad, you, you estimated something and you didn't know all the nuances about it. And when they did it, they found something out. But at least you have a benchmark. Great, great tool for feedback and for, and for general work. Culture and digital water cooler. Culture is the number one reason when we talk to companies who are thinking about remote, the reason they're less likely to do it is they say we can't build culture and we can't build relationships remotely. That's actually not true. It's just that it's different from when you're in the office. So the concept of a digital water cooler is when you create that environment. Like in, in the office, you have forced interactions, right? You're, uh, you're, in, you're going to, you have the digital water cooler, you have, you have your water cooler, which is your physical water cooler in the office. Um, you, have, you have the kitchen, you have uh, the bathroom, like you have forced interactions. Whereas in, um, in, 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 if you're working remotely, you don't have as many forced interactions. So you wanna create that culture where people are uh, online when they're, when they're uh, working and you have them kind of just chat about specific things. It could be work-related, it doesn't have to be though. So you kind of have to build that in um, into the standard. And what we also use is we use Yammer, which is like, a, I'm sure many of you've heard of them. It's basically like a Facebook for companies. And people will post like, oh, I'm traveling to country X. Does anyone know someone there? Is anyone in that city? Uh, what do you recommend I do? Uh, or this weekend I'm going hiking um, and then is, does anyone want to go hiking? And you create that environment, or this is a cool article that's relevant to our business. And so you all, that, it also creates more community and people can like it and comment and, uh, and keep things happening. So I think the key piece around culture and, and relationship building is that you have, to put, you, have to, you have to put some effort into making this work. You have to build a relationship, right? You have to build a relationship. 
Um, and so the video, the video calls I mentioned was one piece that's really important. The second thing that's really important is a lot of the times when people do these check-ins, they keep it purely professional and they'll only do, uh, they'll, they'll do a daily check-in and it's all professional. There's no like personal discussion. So you don't get perspective about that person, their environment, especially if they're international, you might not even know their, their, their background or their culture. So every week we recommend to have one personal check-in. Tell me about what you did over the weekend. Tell me about your family. Tell me about what you like to do, your hobbies. And that gives you perspective about themselves. They might have just had a family wedding and you ask them about you know, their traditions and wedding. You can, so you can create that personal bond um, and then you can also educate yourself about these different countries. But you have to make an effort. A lot of the times people think it's like a wand where you're just like, this is gonna work and I'm gonna go remote, I'm gonna have amazing access to talent. Um, and they don't understand that you're gonna have to change the way you build culture when you're working on a remote team because it's not as easy as having everyone in, 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 in um, face to face. And the second thing is you have to also experiment with different types of um, uh, tr t standards and traditions. So you could try, um, you could try having like a, a video con where everyone's on everyone's online and you do video. And there's a bunch of tools where you can actually whiteboard together. Uh, sometimes people like try to do like a company dance where you have like a remote dance. And so you kind of figure out a time which is like early morning San Francisco, uh, a late morning, early afternoon, uh, late morning in uh, East Coast, and then everyone else would be evening in the in the rest of the world. And you kind of some do some like company dance or whatever you're doing uh, during a company wide meeting uh, that can happen. Uh, also, one thing I wanted to mention was people think that remote work means you never see someone. That's not true. Uh, remote work just means that people have flexibility. Uh, and it, it could, it could, they could be in the same city, they could be abroad. So we also recommend every three months that your team should meet every three months and every year the company should meet. And you can do that in some like exotic location and create for really cool experiences. And that in-person relationship is also valuable. Distributed versus hybrid. This is something that many people confuse. Um, so a distributed team is a team that started uh, remote and has always been remote. A hybrid team is a company that's, uh, that's in one location and then added remote people. Um, and that's very different because you, kn you know that y if you have a thousand people in one office and you just started adding remote people, there's a lot of communication that's happening when you're in a bar or when you're in a meeting or when you're just chatting that could impact a remote developer that you just, you just made a decision. And if you don't have that process in place to properly communicate because you're not used to it, that person's gonna start work, gonna be working on things that you just decided not to do. So you have to make a more effort, and most companies are hybrid. They start, they, they, they're, they're ready, they're not remote, and they start trying to work remotely, and then after a month they realize it's not working out, and they stop. And the reason it's not working out is because they haven't recognized that they need to make, do more steps to, to finish this off. Um, uh, Experimentation. So the key behind the, the moral of the story is that you have to experiment. You have to try different things uh, to make it work. It's not gonna work easily. So you have to invest time, try different things. Start off like telling employees, you know, um, on Fridays you don't have to come to the office. Let's just do that once or half day and try to see how people will work. And it allows you to change, you'll have to change the way you evaluate people from the input, they arrive at this time, the time they leave, to the output, their performance base. It's, gonna, it's not easy. It is not easy at all, but it is very powerful because it's, all, it's a long-term investment. If you look at the long-term trends, people want more autonomy. Long-term trends, Boston, New York, and San Francisco are only gonna get more competitive. Demand for talent is gonna be, demand for tech talent is only gonna increase. So long-term, companies will have to have some sort of remote-like environment. They wanna attract people that want autonomy and they wanna attract great talent. So in the long-term, you're gonna have to figure, this is, I, this is something I strongly believe that people are gonna have to figure out. So it's, gonna be, and it's not gonna happen in like a two week experiment. It's gonna happen over a long term experiment where you're trying different things and you're optimizing different systems. So um, this is my, my LinkedIn and my info. I'm happy to talk to anyone who needs help with remote work, but uh, um, thank you for your time.